when a murder is discovered. The level of abuse, manipulation and violence in this case is truly shocking. Lives are torn apart forever. I miss her voice. I miss her smile. I miss her jokiness. We've all been robbed. It's up to the police. This isn't a young person whose life was cut short by a very aggressive and violent person. To track down the killer. He was doing everything he could to get away with this. And bring them to justice. It's clear that she's under his control to such a point that she's fearful of, of literally living her life. Meet the murder detectives. I think when you look back on the pattern of behaviour, it probably was only a matter of time before he caused somebody really significant harm. Who reveal how they caught the killer. It's one I'll always remember. And I think everybody that worked on this case will never forget. I received a telephone call from the police commander at Oxford um, who'd explained to me that uh, they had a missing girl who was 17 and that he now had concerns about uh, the fact that she'd been missing for a long time. The 17-year-old was Jaden Parkinson, who had been missing for seven days. Jaden was reported missing just after midnight on the 4th of December and she was reported missing by staff at the hostel that she was living at in Oxford. At the time of the case, I was the head of the major crime unit for Thames Valley Police, which is the murder unit, effectively. By this stage, alarm bells were ringing for me because, uh, first of all, the length of time that Jade had been missing without having any contact with anybody, uh, the fact that she had no resources, so she had no money or uh, any way of really looking after herself. Concerned Jaden was vulnerable, senior investigating officer Chris Ward assigned family liaison officers to the case. Nikki Smith was one of them. I was asked to go into the family um, to try and find out literally as much as we could about the lifestyle basically of Jaden, where she would go to, her friends, any families, any arguments they'd had, relationships, financial. The reason why we're trying to get this information is so we can show, hopefully, that she's alive and where she is and to try and track her down. Jaden's mum, Sam, was the first point of contact. Sam told, told me about um, her upbringing in as much as that um, Jaden had lived both with her father and with, with Sam herself. Um, they'd had disputes. At times, Sam and Jaden had fallen out. And I think, yeah, it... it she, she did have a little bit of a chaotic lifestyle. When she first came back to me as a teenager, it was difficult because she tested my staying power as a parent because I'd split up from her dad and her dad had just let her do what she wanted. So we clashed and we bited heads. She was very naughty at school and, you know, she had a lot of run-ins with a lot of people and even the teachers. It was hard work. She was hard work, but she come out at the other end of it um, around about her 15th birthday. I got the impression with um, learning about Jaden that she was quite a, a loving um, girl um, with an infectious smile and just a cheeky nature. Um, and, yes, yeah, she could be rebellious, but she was, she was a young girl growing up, um, you know, and just trying to find a way, really. She, she was vulnerable. Um, there's, no, there's no doubt about that. Jaden had moved out of the family home and into a hostel called One Foot Forward in November 2013. I think it was through a breakdown of the relationship with the mum that she couldn't be, she wasn't at the home address anymore. And I think it was a good thing that she ended up there because it started to some extent to give her some independence. Sam had spoken to her daughter two days before she went missing. Jaden contacted me um, the last weekend of November actually. Frantic, I'd turn my phone off, um, hoping to get a bit of peace and quiet when I put my phone on on the Sunday. I had about 30, 40 missed calls. I rung and she was like, um, I need to see you, I need to speak to you. I was like, what is it? She's like, I'm pregnant. I was like, oh. 
Oh, not with his. And she was like, yeah. With his baby. So the staff at the hostel were able to tell the police that Jaden was in a relationship with a man called Ben Blakely. She discovered that she was pregnant and that she wanted to meet Ben face to face so that she could tell him and discuss what the arrangements would be for the future. What was emerging was that um, they'd had an on and off relationship for about nine months and um, she had had lots of arguments with him. He'd been aggressive towards her and she'd reported that to the staff at One Foot Forward. But they had also heard uh, conversations between Jaden and Ben on the telephone where he was being very aggressive. Um, so it was very much it was a very difficult relationship. Ben was five years older than Jaden, and they first met when she was 15 years old. Jaden met him through Jake, his younger brother. She met him in that group. They was all hanging around with each other. He was obviously a bit of a bad lad, because he was wearing all the latest trainers, the hats, and all this sort of thing, you know. So he was, I suppose, quite flash in that aspect. Um, he smoked, drunk, took drugs, uh, had that attitude. He knew what to say and do to keep Jaden there. He, she wanted love, she wanted attention. And of course, it transpired as Ben got closer and closer and controlling, he would then start to keep her away more from family members. When someone manipulates their partner, as we move across the pathological spectrum to course of control, we then see this manipulation taking on a very sinister feel. So all of a sudden, the manipulation centers around distancing them from any sort of support system that, that they may have, whether this is family or friends, distancing them from any sense of their own kind of identity. So who you are is nothing without me. Jaden and Ben had split up. There were times just prior to that that he was still controlling her. I believe it's like he'd taken her phone from her. She wasn't allowed to leave the room that she was staying in the hostel. She was urinating in bottles um, within there. Although she'd split from him, she wanted to tell him um, and let him know that he was going to be a father of her child. Unfortunately, Ben had so much power over her that even when they're separate, physically separate, he has an ability to have control over her. She still feels fearful of him and feels connected with him. He is there, he's omnipresent, he is everywhere. And, and that, that must have been absolutely frightening for her. Ben was phoned a number of times on the 4th by the officers who were investigating Jaden's disappearance. Um, he was very aggressive. On a number of occasions, he put the phone down. But he said he could offer no help about where Jaden was. The calls were very short in length, and he was very unhelpful. Jaden had a difficult upbringing, and she had a lot of arguments with her family. Um, and there was a, a number of times when Jaden had gone missing. Um, but she'd always returned very shortly after going missing, or she'd always made contact with her family. So it wasn't unusual in those early hours of that investigation, officers wouldn't have been that surprised that she'd gone missing. However, Jaden had already reported Ben to the police just days before she vanished. Ben had, I think, about 30 images of her when she was naked. I'm thinking about maybe 13 videos of her um, that he had threatened to um, put on social media. And that really, really distressed Jaden. Um, and she was really worried about that and really didn't want that to happen. She reported that um, around the end of November. So simultaneously on the 4th, uh, Ben Blakely was arrested um, on suspicion of making indecent images of Jaden. The officers who'd arrested him interviewed Ben Blakely. He denied that anything had happened and he was then bailed from the police station um, to come back at a later date whilst they continued their investigation. Unfortunately, the officers that were dealing with that weren't aware of the missing person report and the fact that Jaden had gone missing. And they were also not aware that other officers who were investigating her disappearance had tried to contact him. 
As the missing person team continued their investigations, they were starting to build up a CCTV trail of Jaden's movements on the day she disappeared. What became obvious at the start of that missing person investigation was that Jaden had arranged to meet Ben in Oxford and police seized the CCTV from Oxford and then it was clear that they got on a train to Didcot Parkway, which is here. So it's from that CCTV we were able to see an image of Ben and Jaden, and that's the last known sighting of Jaden just after 4 p.m. on the 3rd of December. The first time that I had heard of the case was when the police went public, which was around about the first week of December. The only interest that I saw was on a local level and in terms of nationally, not really. And I think it was because she had gone missing before, teenagers go missing and they, they usually turn up. So it hadn't really caught anyone's interest at that stage. Six days after Jaden disappeared, as the police searched for clues as to her whereabouts, a crucial piece of evidence then came to light. As part of the ongoing investigation into Jaden's disappearance, um, the officers were able to recover CCTV from the railway station on the 3rd of December, but later on in the evening, so at 10 o'clock at night. And on that clip of CCTV, it showed Ben Blakely walking back through the concourse of the railway station, but significantly he was on his own and Jaden was nowhere to be seen. So as a result of that, on the 10th of December, Ben Blakely was arrested by the investigating officers on suspicion of kidnapping Jaden. Ben, you've been arrested on suspicion of kidnapping. I'm very okay. I'm very this, crazy, this is in relation to to my ex-girlfriend. OK. What's her name? You tell me you got, you're the one with I've got a paperwork. I've got a lot of paperwork. So this is to do with Jaden Parkinson? Is that your ex-girlfriend? It is. OK. Listen, I'll be, I'll be honest with you, yeah? I don't give a where she is. I don't mm -hmm. care where she is. She's got a new boyfriend. He is here with her. She's nothing to do with me now. I, I'll, I'll give you where she is. That's, I'll be honest, I don't it sounds nasty, I don't want to be nasty, but that's how it is, and that's the truth, I don't care. All right, so go speak to someone else, go Don't you just, your CID day. Go into work and go into hack into her Facebook. You better find her now, say, who nicking me for kidnap? And then you could just hack her internet and find her like that. At that point, they had no evidence um, or any other reason to keep him in custody, so they had to release him be a good move on your part, her part, and our part to tell us now, and we'll tell someone to go round, because we're going to have to have it. Because if she's somewhere else, this I ends. I told you everything I can. Why didn't you get bail now, On the 10th of December 2013, Ben Blakely had been arrested on suspicion of kidnapping his pregnant ex-girlfriend, Jaden Parkinson. She told you that she was pregnant? She did say something like that, but obviously I know better than that. Do you remember the, the call that she made telling you that? Briefly. That was on Monday the 2nd of December. When did you meet her that day or the next day? I don't know. Did you threaten her? Did you Why would I do that? Did you threaten to throw her off a bridge? No, I did not. No, I did not, man. That's Where are you getting this from? Where are you getting this? Tell me. Are you going to tell me where you're getting it from? Well, I ain't, I'm not saying nothing now, innit? I know I've already said that, but this is it. Go on. No, no, no comment.
I think Ben's reaction very much speaks to sort of the antisocial personality traits that he clearly has, sort of this disrespect for authority, um, this kind of almost this sort of uh, hyperinflated ego around, you know, who he is, what he's doing, um, this disregard for other people's feelings. And also it speaks, I think, to some immaturity there as well. It's kind of a game, sort of, you know, he's probably feeling like a bigger person by being able to play this game. On the 11th of December, as head of the major crime unit, Chris Ward was now in charge of the investigation. My gut feeling when I reviewed the case was that something serious had happened to Jaden. I wasn't convinced that she wasn't alive, but everything was suggesting now that some sort of serious harm had come to her. She hadn't had any contact with anybody. Um, she had a partner who she had a very difficult relationship with, and we had a picture of his previous behaviour towards her, and he wasn't being in any way cooperative, so I was very concerned. Jaden's mum, Sam, had last seen her daughter just hours before she disappeared, when they had arranged to meet to discuss her pregnancy. I remember her coming out, bouncing and that, and, you know, like she, like she was. She had her jacket on, her jeans, her hair up in a scruffy bum. We walked round to the pub. I was like, right, you've got three choices. Keep it, abortion, adoption. And we talked through every one of them. I was like, don't discount any of them. And she was like, oh, I've already made my mind up, I'm keeping it. Um, I was like, you sure? She's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, she was chuffed. She was happy. She was blossoming. She was blooming. Do you know what I mean? Um, she didn't want to not have that baby. I've got pictures of me and her hugging that day in the pub, and you can see the absolute pleasure on her face, but you can see the absolute horror in mine. The police were now aware of just how dangerous Ben Blakely was. Sam had the impression through knowledge of hers, um, telling us that he was uh, quite racist, quite a bully, um, quite controlling. He would, um, she'd seen um, injuries on her daughter, bites and scratches. In 2013, I think January, her best friend Remy, there's a little group of them that were all born at the same time. Apparently Jaden was getting undressed and it was then that she noticed the burn marks on Jaden's breasts and Jane confided in her and told her that it was Ben that was burning up. This had escalated, obviously, from the emotional abuse to then um, very physical abuse, which shows that he had a lack of impulse control. There was no self-regulation within him to stop himself doing that. There was no second thought to it. The really pathological end where we see manipulation, it's actual threat. It's kind of threat of, of, of violence, so you become afraid. Literally every kind of human, basic human right that you have is taken away and you feel beholden on this person. Your abuser becomes your lifeline and it's this paradox that's so destabilizing. You kind of get confused about your own sense of control over your own life. Seven days after Jaden had been reported missing, Chris Ward escalated the investigation. I made the decision that Ben Blakely needed to be arrested and brought into custody on suspicion of murdering Jaden. Even though uh, I wasn't sure that she'd died, it's important that he now came in and we could start investigating. We were able to search his premises, we were able to see his phones, we were, that kind of thing. So that opened up a whole new investigation uh, into him, more avenues. I knew then that we had probably 36 hours to keep Ben Blakely in custody. From that time, we needed to be sure that either Jaden was alive or that we had sufficient evidence of Ben Blakely's involvement in her disappearance and death that we could charge him with an offence. And then, um, while all this is going on, while all our colleagues are looking for her and search teams out, we were desperately trying to show that Jaden was still alive somehow, whether that be through finance, through CCTV, through friends, different locations where she'd been for anything. But it was very soon after that, after Ben had been arrested, that we then literally had exhausted, to some extent, as much as we could, lines of inquiry to show proof of life. 
It's really difficult, I think, because the, the family read you as well. They read you like a book. Um, so it's, it's really, it, up until then, you have to be so careful about how your own body language is, is displayed to them. You have to have that hope, but not give them false hope. So it was really difficult to now have to go back and say, we have tried to show the proof of life, but the senior investigating officer is now have to, having to deem this as a murder investigation. And um, Ben's been arrested for her murder. I had a feeling in my gut, she's dead, she weren't coming home. Don't know how I had that feeling, I don't, I can't explain that feeling. Um, but you know, you do know. It's just one of those things, just... For her to disappear off the face of the earth, no sight. Not even a friend, not even a phone call, nothing for her from being so happy. Or he's got her held hostage somewhere, which was what I was hoping. It wasn't long after then, I think I was told to expect a body rather than living proof, because it had been too long. And they warned me that they were going to do a news coverage. The police then told the media that they were making a murder inquiry and they had arrested a man called Ben Blakely, who they called her ex-boyfriend. And I remember the information just ramped up. We just started, the, the case really took off, I guess. I spoke to a lot of her friends and it seemed like and all the evidence showed that she was she was under his control. She just couldn't get away from him because she was terrified what he would do. She had attempted to leave him, but as we know, she did go back to him because that night she, she went to meet him. Ben Blakely was interviewed a number of times by detectives and to all the questions that were designed to help to try and find Jaden, he said no comment. That's it, nothing more to say. Wait, let's terminate this. Right, that's it, end up. Stick me back in my cold, my old self. So, on that first day that I took over the investigation, we got our first major breakthrough, and that was because a taxi driver came forward and said that he had picked up a man um, in a remote part of Didcot uh, in the early hours of the morning. This man had a suitcase, a large blue suitcase, and the taxi driver felt that. That suitcase was very heavy. He had to help the man into the car with it. And because of the time of day, uh, and because he now knew somebody was missing, he was very worried that something suspicious was in the suitcase. When we looked at the telephone records, um, it then became clear that the telephone that had been used to make that call to the taxi company was Ben Blakely's mobile phone. The analysis of Ben's phone, the calls that were made and the locations that they were made from. Uh, we were able to establish that um, there were some locations in Didcot that he had been. So just over here um, is an area which is really significant. That's an area called the Spooky Barn. Um, so this is an old dilapidated barn building where lots of youths used to hang around and drink. Um, and it was also somewhere that we, we found that Jaden and Ben had been previously, so it became very significant to the investigation. So we treated that as a crime scene, and I asked for that to be searched in a lot of details, like a fingertip search. During that search, in the bushes nearby, was a bracelet, and that was a bracelet that was very similar to the one that Jaden had worn, and one that had the key to her room at the hospital. So at the point in which we'd found the bracelet, I asked for the police search dogs to come into the barn area. The cadaver dogs are really useful tools because they can search vast areas really quite quickly. They're trained to detect the chemicals of decomposition. So dogs are really sensitive to that kind of chemical profile and they, they're attracted to it. The thing about the cadaver dogs and their indications is that they can, they can indicate on really trace levels of material. 
they were deployed within the barn. Very quickly, they started to indicate that a body had been present in the barn and also just outside the barn, uh, very near where the bracelet had been found. The mood changes both in the investigation team because it changes from we had quite a lot of hope to, at the beginning to actually, you know, this is now extremely serious and actually there's somebody out there that's killed somebody and we need to find her because we need to return her to her family, which is the most important thing, but also because it's so evidentially important. Whilst you can successfully, and it, that has happened, prosecute a murder without a body, it's very, very difficult. In Oxfordshire, the police team searching for missing teenager Jaden were now convinced she had been murdered, but without a body were struggling to prove it. The police then made another appeal, uh, saying that they wanted anyone who had uh, witnessed a man hauling around a suitcase, you know, late at night in the countryside in Oxford. And that's when it was really obvious that this case was just, just something else. After the press appeal, a witness came forward with information that added a disturbing twist to the case. A member of the public phoned up and said that uh, Ben Blakely's brother, Jake Blakely, was living with her and that he had tried to dispose of some clothing um, which was covered in mud and that she was very suspicious about this. So I instructed officers to go to that house and he was then arrested um, on suspicion of murder uh, around the disappearance of Jaden. Jake was very good friends with Jaden. Um, in fact, that's how she came to meet Ben. So it was quite sad and distressing, I suppose, really, for Jake to be arrested when actually he's a friend. He was a friend of Jaden's. As part of the investigation of uh, what we call house-to-house -house inquiries, one of those houses, unbeknown to us at the time, was Ben and Jake's grandmother and when the officers knocked on her door uh, having seen the appeal for the suitcase her first words were have you come to collect the suitcase which took the officers completely by surprise in terms of forensic opportunities that suitcase was massively important because I believe now that Jaden had been in that suitcase uh, that she'd been murdered. Along with the suitcase, two spades were also recovered from the same house. At this point, um, you know, I'm looking at the po possibilities of how Jaden's body had been disposed of. So, statistically, um, it, it is norm normally burial. So we have the spades, the mud, the suitcase. So I believe now that Jaden had been buried somewhere. Uh, so I brought in a forensic archaeologist so that he could advise us about potential sites and what we need to do next in order to try and find Jaden. So once the suitcase was recovered, it would have been um, subjected to a full forensic examination. So that means recovery of hairs, fibres, um, any material that might have been collected in, let's say, the wheels or the mechanisms of the suitcase. And then they would be able to compare those samples recovered from it, from any control samples that they'd recovered from the spooky barn site and any other potential um, deposition sites that they might identify to see whether or not there's any discernible link between either um, the victim and the suitcase or the scene and the suitcase. The forensic archaeologist was on the ground looking for uh, areas that Jaden may have been buried in that we'd identified, but it's very rural and it's a massive area. Um, I thought it would be beneficial for aerial work to be carried out in fact, what we did manage to secure was the help of the RAF and they did a flyover of the area in which we were interested in and they were able to pinpoint 10 sites which they said were significant. It's then necessary to put those in some kind of order of, of priority. The search teams began to look at the locations at the top of the list. The pressure was on for Chris and his team. 
So we're now the 15th of December, so we're very close to the timeline where Ben has been in custody for the maximum amount of time. There was a number of significant pieces of evidence which were circumstantial. So with all that information and evidence, um, the Crown Prosecution Service authorised a charge of murder against Ben Blakely. But of course, the one bit of evidence that we didn't have was Jaden's body and the lawyer at the Crown Prosecution Service explained that it was important that we found that body within the next seven days because without that, it was likely that Ben Blakely would be released from custody. So in terms of Jake Blakely, um, there was insufficient evidence to suggest that he had been involved in the murder of Jaden. So the Crown Prosecution Service authorised a charge of perverting the course of justice. So whilst Jake was being charged with uh, that offence, his solicitor uh, received a note from Jake which he passed to the officers. And that note said that as far as he believed, the body of Jaden Parkinson was in the grave of his uncle Alan. Um, and that was pretty much the note. Um, and it was in St Mary's churchyard. The RAF had already pinpointed this location during the aerial investigations, but it was placed at the bottom of the priority list. So the reason this was number 10 on the list was that it wouldn't have been unusual for soil to be moved in a graveyard, but the connection that we then made was that there was a grave that was related to the Blakeleys. In fact, that grave was their uncle Alan's. I dispatched a team of officers to here and they sealed off the churchyard and treated it as a crime scene. When they announced that they were searching a cemetery in Didcot, it was one of those moments where you clear the front page and, and this story became huge for so many reasons. But the police had said at the time this is the, the first that they know of, a, of someone being buried, someone being murdered and buried in an established grave because of that gruesome detail. That's just... I think what made the media just even more interested in the story than they were before. The forensic archaeologist began excavating in the grave and soon found a body. We left Sam at home. I was literally driving home and we got a phone call to say that a body had been discovered and it was immediately, it was almost dread, but equally it was like, let it be Jaden, you know, because we need to be able to bring her body back. And and going back and telling them for Sam, it's 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 almost like you you you're hitting her again with it. Yes, she, first her daughter's gone missing and she's expecting the worst, but she's got that hope. And then, you know, you tell her it's a murder investigation, and there's still a little bit of hope there. You then say, we found the body. It's like that is it. The hope's gone. Everything's gone. When they confirmed they'd found Jaden, it was just... It was just so horrifying because, as a journalist, you are... Obviously, your, your job is to report the story, is to be impartial. But, you know, on a personal level, when you go home and close the door and you're in your own space, you just... You can't help but be completely overwhelmed by it. I, mean, I had been covering the story, I'd seen the CCTV footage of her, her last moments, which we didn't know were her last moments at that stage. And you hold out hope as well that, that she'll be found. So during the post-mortem examination of Jaden's body, um, a couple of things became clear. One, she had significant bruising around her eyes and the side of her head. So. Um, it was clear that she'd been punched and beaten, but more significantly, around her neck and her throat area were finger marks, and it was those finger marks that were able to establish that Jaden had been strangled and uh, asphyxiated. When we look at strangulations, there's something kind of intimate, but also purposeful, 
in that action, right? So a strangulation doesn't happen I immediately. This is something that takes time. So there's a commitment to this clearly when it's happening, or it speaks to a complete lack of control, or it speaks to even an enjoyment of being that close to to the horror of it all, being you know able to control that kind of teetering between life and death. I identified a body on the 20th of December. And that was something that he couldn't take. On the 18th of December 2013, two weeks after Jaden had disappeared, her body had been found in a pre-existing grave. Her ex-boyfriend, Ben Blakely, and his brother, Jake, were now in custody, awaiting the trial. People were just so shocked by it. You know, that, that phrase that you often hear is, you just don't expect this to happen here. People had congregated outside the church, and they were leaving flowers, and people were crying. They were, there was just this, this kind of this sense of people felt sick by it. Uh, by what had happened to her and the way in which she had died. We had a memorial in Didcot, um, which was before the funeral, I think that was in January, where we let off balloons outside the church. The, the church was full to burst it um, on both occasions. Um, obviously, the one in Didcot, um, that was the first time I'd been in that church since they'd found her. I remember going up there and outside the church, there was just row upon row of flowers. There was teddy bears. With Jaden finally laid to rest by her family, the trial date was fast approaching when something unexpected happened. First of all, Ben had to supply to the court what he says is his defense to the charge of murder. Uh, and secondly, he visited the prison chaplain. And when he visited the prison chaplain, he handed him a letter, which I then became um, aware of. And in that letter, it said that he had been involved in Jaden's death, that he had had an argument with her um, in a field near the spooky barn. Um, he put his hands round her throat, uh, but he hadn't intended to kill her. She'd fallen off the bridge, and that resulted in her dying and he tried to resuscitate her but he wasn't able to and he was very sorry and that he loved Jaden. I think that Jaden went with Ben to the spooky barn because she felt comfortable there because they'd been there before um, and I think that's where Ben lost his temper. Uh, I think there was a fight and I think he strangled her within the barn uh, and then spent some considerable time dragging her body across the field where he then buried it in a shallow grave. 
And then, in his account, I accept that he went back and dug her up, put her in the suitcase, and then brought her to this area where she was buried. On the 23rd of June, 2014, the trial began at Oxford Crown Court. Every day of the trial, we was taken in the back way rather than the front because of the press. It was horrible watching him and his brother. That's, I think that's the first time I realised it was Jake that had been arrested. Obviously, we weren't allowed to say it was Jake when we come out of court because of him being 17, the same age as Jaden at the time. It was really tense in the, the courtroom. There was this real sense of anxiety for her family. When you're reporting, you want to make a note of how the defendant is behaving, how they're looking, especially when evidence has been given. And he would eyeball the journalists. And I remember just turning around to some of my colleagues and just saying, this is really uncomfortable. They would be laughing, joking, gesticulating to the family. And they didn't care. <laughs> like ben didn't care. His behaviour in court was something I'd never seen in 31 years in the police. It was just incredible. He was very aggressive. Um, he was frequently shouting, swearing from the dock. He threatened to stab the barrister. Uh, he was swearing to the point where the judge had to keep sending him back to the cells because his behaviour was so aggressive. It was incredible. What I find fascinating is that in a court, that's an opportunity for the defendant to, to perhaps show that there's someone to sympathise with, someone to empathise with, to show that he didn't mean to kill Jaden. But his entire behaviour, and there were moments when he had... when he, you know, there were outbursts, there were moments when he swore in court that... he just couldn't help showing who he was. Part of Ben Blakely's defence was that he had previously put his hands around the throat of women and they hadn't died, so why should it be any different in this case, which is somewhat bizarre, but um, we were able to find his ex-partners, some of whom had reported domestic abuse to the police previously, and they came and gave evidence, and that was really, really, really important because um, that just showed a, a person that had propensity to do this, he'd done it previously, he, it, didn't, it wasn't something that worried him, and um, it was part of his aggression and his control over people. I think it very much probably spoke to his inability to kind of have a healthy relationship. It may have come from, uh, you know, his disrespect um, for, for women, this need for control, this, um, you know, clearly some sort of personality traits that made him feel less likely to empathize with someone, to see women as possessions. Um, and as a consequence, this made him very dangerous indeed. Jake Blakely pleads guilty to perverting the course of justice in that he lied to the police during the murder investigation and he was sentenced to three and a half years. So on his own admission, Jake had been present when that grave was dug and he gave his explanation for that and he was found not guilty of any further offences. After four weeks, the jury retired to deliberate the verdict of Ben Blakely. It's horrendous. You feel sick. I feel sick as a, as a police officer, and it's not my family member. Um, they were just beside themselves when that jury came in. It was a very emotional moment for Jaden Parkinson's mum. She burst into tears and held on to her family and then walked out of court in hysterics as the, the jury delivered their verdict. They uh, retired a week ago, but today, uh, by a majority of 11 to 1, they have found 22-year-old Ben Blakely guilty of the murder of his ex-girlfriend, 17-year-old Jaden Parkinson. This is a tragic case of what happens when coercive control is left to escalate. Regardless of the age, this is two young people, but it led to murder. Ben Blakely was sentenced to life with a minimum tariff of 20 years. There's always a sense of relief at the end of a successful case, but it's a team effort, so you know, the team that were working with me did an amazing job. Um, but it's always really sad because um, I'd always hoped when I took on this investigation that we would find Jade and then return her to her mother, but sadly that wasn't the case. Whenever I say Jaden's name, she always kind of makes me smile because I just, I, I, 
I have a really nice image of, of Jaden, um, um, you know, with her smiling uh, and things like that. People like him come and go in that respect. There's always evil people out there. Um, but um, Jaden, yeah, she was a nice kid, you know, and people don't forget her, which is good. Her life was about to change. The day after, well, the day after I see her, she was due to go to the doctors, confirm the pregnancy, which then would have led to her being in a mother and baby unit uh, till she gave birth. In that mother and baby unit, they would have then helped her go to college, which she'd chosen hairdressing. So, yeah, she was making plans for the future. Big plans, good plans. We've missed a big chunk. We miss a big chunk. I miss her voice. I miss her smile. I miss her jokiness. I miss her nicking my clothes, my makeup. I miss it all. We've all been robbed. And you know what? It doesn't stop for us. Ours is a life sentence.